do this um, and just sort of think about it. Um, I'll, I won't read out too much, um, but uh, just in, in brief, she's 59, uh, COPD, hypertension, some pain. She's a smoker. And, and the reason she comes in is she has a short episode of visual blurring, uh, and that's this gray color that lasts about 30 seconds and nothing else really, no other symptoms. Um, normal examination, and out of interest in her blood test, she's slightly anemic, um, but the main thing is that she has a raised CRP and also an ESR. So the CRP is 50, ESR is 70. So um, with that in mind, um, what I'll do is I'll give you to ask what your differentials are. So maybe just have like 20 seconds Jot down some differentials and see what you think. And I'll go back actually, sorry, so that people can look through it again. Sorry, my bad. So yeah, so you can, can think about it a bit more. Um, any problems, just put in the chat or anything or question, and then yeah, that should do it. All right, uh, so now, now that you guys have sort of thought about it a bit, uh, I think it's time for us to um, uh, look through. So let's see. So people have gone through the differentials. Very good. So looking back at this lady, you have someone, the main issue is that she's got transient visual blurring. So instantly, you know, it's a sort of neurological problem. Um, the key is sort of that it's, it's only happened for about 30 seconds or so and not really much information otherwise. And there's no other features, which is very important. So really, you've just got some visual loss. So the thing, the thing we were going to think about now is what our differentials are for visual loss. So get a piece of paper that you, you wrote down and, and these are my own differentials. So the first thing that I thought about when I saw this patient was I was thinking, could this be a giant cell arthritis? And I think perhaps it's the first thing that comes to your head in, in a way because you have this raised ESR, isn't it? Which is, you know, uh, unusual in a sense in, in this sort of lady, in this lady. Um, the other thing uh, that kind of hits you is that you've got a previous history of this pain, which is a bit non-specific. So you wonder whether or not it's polymyalgia rheumatica, um, which it hasn't really been diagnosed. This particular lady, when I saw her, she was awaiting going to the rheumatology clinic. But also one thing that was really important in giant cell arthritis is that you, you have, it text, tends to be in someone who's a bit older. So usually in the over 65s. So it's not really in the right age range. Um, and then the last thing about giant cell arthritis is that you'd expect probably a slightly more uh, long-term uh, history rather than 30 seconds. Um, the next thing is, um, a transient ischemic attack, which is fine in the sense because it has a short duration. Um, and then um, the other thing is that you have a certain subtype, which is um, when you just have visual blurring and it tends to be in one of the, um, the arteries in the eye. And that is classically described as a gray curtain that falls down. And that's called amurosis fugax. Um, so that would fit in with a transient ischemic attack. That's one of the differentials. And then you have this uh, history of a, um, a possible migraine. So you can have some transient neurological symptoms sometimes. But again, you'd expect migraines to last a few hours rather than a few seconds or maybe half an hour, or maybe, you know, it, something a bit longer. So you wouldn't expect that. So in neurology, duration is very important, as you see. And if someone who has a very short duration, you'd expect it more likely to be a vascular thing. And if something is a more longer duration, sort of hours to days, you'd be thinking more likely to be sort of functional brain stuff like migraines or seizures. And if you've got a bit longer, then you may think of stuff like tumors. So if someone has stuff that's been going on for um, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, then you'd be more thinking along the lines of having a brain tumor. In this case, you had no headaches, you had no photophobia, short duration, less likely, and seizure again, quite focal. You probably, you know, seizures, and again, they can be focal, but realistically, you're just a bit of visual loss on one side, where it doesn't really fit having a seizure. So that's a differential diagnosis for this particular patient. Um, so as you would in a normal medical ward, um, maybe have kind of 15, 20 seconds to have a read through this ECG. Uh, and the main question I want you to ask yourself is what you're really looking for in the context of your differentials. So have 20 seconds to look through this and tell, tell me what you think. Cool. Yeah, so I don't want to give you too much time because uh, we've got a lot to go through. So if you look at this ECG, the way to read an ECG is first, you make sure that the, the name of the patient is there and also the details are there. You've got the right patient. And then uh, the time and date it was taken, which is fine uh, you may, because sometimes nurses will hand you an ECG and you've got to know that's the right patient and it's the one that's now been done, not yesterday. Uh, and then you look at the rhythm strip, so two. 
And the key thing is you want to look at the rate. So you see that um, another way I calculate it is that it's usually 300 over the number of small squares, sorry, large squares. So one, two, three, four, 300 over 75, um, and that's sort of 75. And then you see if it is so 75 beats per minute, and then you do you look at the, if it's regular or irregular, looks regular to me. Is there a P wave before every QRS? And is it narrow complex? which it is. So you'd say this is sinus rhythm, yeah? Um, so the, and, and well, I'm not gonna look at the rest of it, I just wanted to really look at the, uh, the rhythm strip. But does anyone know the answer to this question? What are you looking for in the context of your differentials? Um, does anyone think what, what the key thing, if I, was look, if I go back to my differentials, what, what is the key thing I'm looking for in, uh, in the ECG? Does anyone know? Cool. Yeah, brilliant. So some people are saying atrial fibrillation, which is absolutely correct. So basically, yeah, so you've got someone with a transient ischemic attack. Well, and equally with transient ischemic attacks and stroke, um, the most uh, important risk factor is atrial fibrillation. So in this particular scenario, if we were to look for atrial fibrillation in the context of what I was saying, you would then find that you would have an irregular heart rate. And also you would not find P waves before every QRS. And that increases your risk um, or increases your index of suspicion that this patient has transient ischemic attack. Okay, cool. So the other thing is very important for, um, the someone is asking on the chat so can post ictal ecgs be tachycardic uh, yes you can be tachycardic post ictal uh, but tachycardic tachycardia is very non-specific so it wouldn't really be so helpful in this case so uh, luckily for you i suppose um in, in a, from a diagnostic sense she actually came into the emergency department a few days ago she's known to have anxiety and uh, she has a panic attack so they did a chest x-ray and um, so maybe just have uh, 10 seconds to, to see what you think um and um yeah, so look at this x-ray and tell me if you see anything abnormal. Is it normal? Is it abnormal? Um, so yeah, so tell me what you think on the chat if anyone knows. You know, if anyone kind of see anything, is it normal? Does it look normal to you guys? I don't know. Um, okay, so someone's saying cardiomegaly. I don't think it's cardiomegaly. So it's, it's a PA film, I think. Um, so I wouldn't say it's cardiomegaly. Um, it, it's not so easy to think because sometimes, you know when you look at chest x-rays and you think there's a huge abnormality and then the consultant comes and says, no, no, that's fine. So yeah, you say it looks normal, uh, which uh, lots of people uh, it can say it's fine. But if you look very closely and with a you know, reasonable index of suspicion, you can see that there's probably a lesion there. Do you see that? That looks like a circular lesion to me. Uh, I know it's difficult because sometimes you can, it can be sort of just patchy, but, but equally out of interest, there's no real other patchy bits that you can see. So this is the only real patchy bit. This is a real x-ray, by the way, I'm not making this up, uh, just in case you're wondering. And I'll show you the CT as well, just to sort of clarify these things. So yeah, so this x-ray, you can see there's a circular lesion. So then um, I'm gonna give you 20 seconds, again on the piece of paper, just write down what your differentials are for a solitary circular lesion on a chest x-ray, because that sort of thing is some stuff you need to think about. Good, so write that all that down and then you can compare. It's a good way to learn. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll stop there uh, and see what people think. Um, and then, so, so what are your differentials, which we've talked about? Um, so these are my differentials for a circular lesion on a chest x-ray. So the most obvious and the most important thing is to ensure that you rule out a malignant tumor. So that's going to be your first differential. Of course, in certain patients, you ha can have more benign tumors that just are in the lung and don't do anything. And, you, and that's called a, sometimes can be called a hamartoma. Um, and you can get sort of uh, in sort of more niche stuff, like more sort of um, arteriovascular lesions, AVMs, you can get that in the lungs anyways. Um, and um, that can be associated with certain diseases if it's an AVM, such as, does anyone know? Uh, by any chance. So the, the one is like hereditary uh, telangiectasia, so you can get that as well. Um, and the other stuff is like infection bits, abscess, infection like TB, histoplasmosis, niche, very niche, but actually more commonly you might get like a rheumatoid nodule and that's something you can get in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and sarcoidosis. Um, but realistically speaking, you're really thinking, is this a tumor? But obviously, and, and a good way of doing it is using like a surgical sieve, so like something like vitamin D, uh, so vascular, inflammatory, infectious, trauma, autoimmune, metabolic, uh, neoplastic, and that sort of helps um, in terms of trying to figure out your differentials, especially when you're doing finals. 
So we look at more detailed history and she has a history of COPD, as we know. She's felt more breathless since November and she has an exercise tolerance of 300 yards. She can't really climb steps without stopping. And then she had, she's not really, you know, her COPD actually seems well controlled. She hasn't really had much in the way of chest infection, but she does, she does smoke. Um, and she's not had any weight loss. So can we make a unifying diagnosis? Yeah, probably. So I think with all this considered, we have someone who probably has a transient ischemic attack, very short acting, probably secondary to a new diagnosis of lung cancer um, because she has COPD, she's got risk factors, uh, she smokes, um, and the other stuff doesn't really match as much. And also the most important thing really, is the thing that sort of knocked us was the fact that uh, thinking it, what actually happened when we were on the ward is that we were really searching for GCA because we were like, oh, what's the cause of this raised ESR? Surely, you know, she must have GCA because he, her ESR is raised. So that's one important thing about how to interpret um, uh, bloods uh, when you are considering patients. So you need to consider patients as a whole and not be sort of honing down on something too early when actually it doesn't fit as much. And that's what the rheumatologists were telling us a lot. Like, no, no, something else, something else. And then actually she does have lung cancer. So um, with that in mind, let's talk a few bit about certain ways of um, interpreting blood tests. So um, markers of inflammation and infection um, are very important because it helps us to decide on whether or not the patient is unwell because of an infection and also whether or not they need antibiotics. So um, white blood cells are very, very important. Um, and uh, we use them a lot um, in terms of whether or not patients got raised white blood cells. Um, but if it's very, very raised, of course, as you might know, it may be consistent with like a lymphoma or a, um, especially elderly patients, a chronic lymphocytic leukemia so that can be very, very raised white cells. Um, CRP is a C-reactive protein, which you guys know about. Um, so does anyone know any instances where CRP is not very useful? Um, if you do know, just put it on the chat. Um, it's, uh, does anyone know? Post-op, absolutely, yeah. So patients who are post-op, um, they, as you might expect, um, they have a lot of uh, inflammation and they have a lot of stuff going on because someone has actually put a, a knife to the skin and all these organs. So in fact, it's not very useful. So what we see if someone has an operation, um, the day after the CRP is super, super raised, um, and then it sort of tails down after a while. So it's not very, it's not very useful post-op, which is tough because if you're a orthopedic F1 and you have someone who has a hip fracture and then the day after they go off and they become really febrile and their CRP is 400, do you really trust the CRP? So then it really depends on your own clinical understanding of infection. So that's why. Um, ESR um, is also another one that we use. So we know it a lot in rheumatology um, and also in uh, giant cell arthritis. Um, equally, um, sometimes it ra raises, but CRP doesn't. So for example, in lupus, that's the classic one where ESR is raised and CRP isn't because it's more of a marker of inflammation rather than infection. Other stuff such as ferritin is very important. Um, ferritin you may associate with hereditary hemochromatosis, but in fact, it can be raised. It is an acute phase reactant. Fibrinogen um, is very important. It is a clotting breakdown product, so it can be raised in severe sepsis and also, as you may know, in disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Platelets uh, can go high or can, they can go low, uh, depending. Uh, I'm not really, there is some science behind it, which I don't know, I'm afraid, but they can go in either way. And then ceruloplasmin also uh, can be low, um, and that is something we use a lot in Wilson's disease, but actually um, we would not really use it in the acute medical wards. And albumin is very, very low in patients who have severe sepsis as well or who are affected. You may know albumin um, in the sense that it's a marker of underhydrate, undernutrition, but in fact, it can be used quite often for patients who have an infection, especially in the ITU setting as well. Sometimes you may need to replace the albumin as well. Cool. Right, um, just a quick bit on giant cell arthritis. Uh, we talked a bit about it, this association with uh, PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, mainly older patients, Headache, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, but can just have headache um, and also this painless loss of vision. Uh, we usually give prednisolone to start off with high doses. And whenever you're giving someone prednisolone, you should also give um, bisphosphonates as well, especially for the elderly to prevent osteoporosis when you give them for long periods of time. And you also should give them a PPI cover, which is um, sort of a meprazole or lanzoprazole in order to reduce the risk of a peptic ulcer, which is very important in this group of patients because steroids can cause peptic ulcers. 
Uh, lung cancer in brief, um, as we're talking about it, um, yeah, the symptoms can be quite nonspecific. Um, so obviously you can get cough, you can get hemoptysis, um, coughing up blood. Also you can get sort of chest pain, weight loss, anorexia. Um, I don't want to go into lung cancer in too much detail because we'll, we'll be doing this uh, a lot in patients in the next few sessions. We're going to do a bit of rest SBA sessions. Um, but finger clubbing is common. Um, you can get hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, and that's sort of a, um, it's sort of a, in a way an extension of clubbing where you get this sort of wrist pain, you get this uh, hypertrophic um, joints basically that can be quite painful for patients. Uh, if, the tube, if you have what is called a pancos tumor, you can get Horner syndrome um, as you are affecting the sympathetic supply, um, and also you can get pleural effusions and some paraneoplastic syndromes. I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail now. I'm sure we'll be able to go through it uh, later. Um, we'll do a lung cancer session um, in a bit more detail. Um, and finally, with TIAs, um, just to go through, um, usually a focal neurological disturbance. I think classically we say it's less than 24 hours, but realistically they usually last less than one hour. And when you have someone who comes in, uh, you would ideally do a CT head just to make sure there's nothing uh, abnormal. Um, so this is a normal CT scan, which is what you should expect in someone who has a transient ischemic attack. Uh, carotid dopplers are very important because you want to look at the vessels um, and see whether or not there's any evidence of a uh, thrombosis um, or well, not thrombosis per se, but if there's any plaque. Um, and if there's any plaque, you may be a candidate for uh, surgery uh, to try and remove that uh, carotid endarterectomy. So that's why you do dopplers. ECG for AF, echocardiogram is because if you're looking for, if you have a cardiac thrombus, sometimes that can shoot up into the brain. And generally speaking, you may do cholesterol, HbA1c, um, and uh, if you have younger patients as causes of TIA and stroke, you would do an inflammatory screen. Uh, stuff like lupus anticoagulant is quite important. Um, and that we, we see that in, more commonly in younger patients. Um, when someone does have a TIA, lifestyle advice is very important. So smoking, drinking, looking after their health, eating well. Antiplatelets uh, can be either aspirin or clopidogrel, depending on where you work, a statin, and also you can strive for one month. So that is important. Um, so that you, they don't actually need to tell the DBLA. Uh, so uh, they can just not drive for a month. And if they're fine, then they, they can go back to driving without telling the DBLA as long as they don't have any other symptoms. So that's generally what, uh, how TIA's management is when you see them in the emergency department. Cool. So uh, jot down, uh, I'll give you 20 seconds. What are the next important investigations in patients with lung cancer? So we'll, we'll go down this route now. Um, so... Let's give you 10, 15 seconds, another five seconds. Have a think. Cool. Um, fine. All right. Very good. So, uh, important investigations in lung cancer. So, so this is actually this patient's uh, sort of representation of the CT. So, do you remember we saw the X-ray and you said, "Oh, maybe it doesn't look like a circular lesion," but actually it is when you do the CT scan. So, this is a CT scan. So, realistically, you want to do a CT chest to start off with because you want to see whether or not it actually is a tumor or looks like a tumor. And you, you can't see it so well here, but you can sort of see it's a bit spiculated, which is more suspicious of the tumor rather than if it was benign, where it's more sort of round and and uh, and not not having strands that looks more. Uh, that definitely would look more uh, malignant. Um, and then realistically, you're going to want to say, think to yourself, do, can we do surgery? And that's the main question. And when you ask that question, you want to know, is it anywhere else? Is it malignant? Um, so, so is it sort of spread everywhere? Can, is this metastatic? Um, and then you do staging imaging. So in the, in the past, people used to do CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and they still do it. Also, an additional thing that people use is a PET scan. And that sort of lights up any bits around the body that have uh, a uh, evidence of increased glucose uptake, which may be cancerous. Lung function tests are very important to see whether or not she's fit for surgery, but also in this particular patient, it seems all right. So in the sense that her exercise tolerance is okay, probably not going to be an issue, but you should do them. And then the next thing is, do you do a lung bi biopsy? And what people tend to do is you can do a CT guided lung biopsy. And um, so if you can actually get to it, um, if it's an amenable area, you, the, one of the radiologists will try and get to it by putting a big needle there and trying to take a biopsy and send it over. Cool. So she undergoes a CT guided lung biopsy. So you can see that image there. 
Uh, so that is, this is not th this patient, uh, it's a similar patient, but just to show you what a CT guide biopsy looks like. But after the procedure, she has severe chest pain and shortness of breath, and her heart rate is 110, her stats are 91, BP is 110 over 80, and her respirator is 28. Okay, so this is, you're the F1 on the ward, she's your patient, Come, you come in, what do you do next? So 20 seconds, and tell me what you would do. You can even write down what you would do in an OSCE scenario. Oh, good. A, B, C, D, E, love it. Okay, good, that's that. So, so tell me what you would, so think, think in your head what you would do on, God, some people are saying good stuff. You aspirate straight away, tension, pneumothorax, chest x-ray, full flow, oxygen. Okay, check tricky essential. Okay, cool. So we've got lots of nice ideas. That's good. And then we go in and then, okay, so here you are. So you got you do your ABCD approach as you would. You check if the airway is patterned. Is the patient speaking to you? The patient is speaking to you. They're very anxious. They're talking, you know, they're breathing heavily. Um, uh, and then you do, but uh, they're fine. Airway is fine. You know, there, there's no concerns. If you had any concerns, you may put a nasopharyngeal airway, a Gadel airway. But in fact, on the most part, you wouldn't if the patient was talking to you because they wouldn't be able to uh, tolerate it. So then you be ch check the chest. If it's good to get air into bilaterally. You check the SATs, which, as we said, were, uh, what were they, 91% on two liters? Were they? Yeah, 91% on room air, fine. Uh, and then your respirate uh, is, is um, so let's say a respirate is 25. And the key thing is to check if there's any tracheal deviation because we're worried about a tension pneumothorax. If it is a tension pneumothorax, you may have tracheal deviation. Uh, and then C, you check your peripheries, check the cap refill if it's warm and well perfused, blood pressure, the heart rate, ensure you have IV access. And also you may put in you know, a catheter for your outputs. Maybe not in this case right now, but you would going forward. And then you check the blood glucose, you check the pupils and you check the GCS, GCS 15, equal reactive to light, glucose is seven. Um, and then her, check the abdomen, check the calves, there's any DBT, shortness of breath, is there a PE? And then you organize more investigations, ECG is useful, chest x-ray, Bloods and BBG. So that's how I would do it in an OSCE scenario if you had it, just thinking through stuff. I hope I hope that's useful for you guys just to sort of run through it. Cool. Oh no. Okay, there's an X-ray. What do you guys see on this chest X-ray? Uh, anything exciting? Um, so someone's asking why you would do a VBG or an ABG. Yeah, actually, probably you would do an ABG to be honest in this particular scenario. Um, so I, I put VBG because you sort of take it with the bloods, I guess, but you would also do an ABG. I think that'd be useful. Yeah, fine. So people are, people found that she's got a pneumothorax. Um, fine. So I think you sort of, some people, some people are saying, why would you do an x-ray with if someone we suspect tension pneumothorax. Well, in fact, in this particular lady, we don't suspect tension pneumothorax because the trachea isn't deviated. And actually she's not doing too bad on her, in her SATs. So you can see sort of, it's actually like, um, what is it? Yeah, 91% of room air, probably give her a bit of oxygen, she'll be fine with it. And also her trachea, you can see, it. you can really see it very well, but you can see it's not deviated here. It's sort of slightly moved slightly, but it's not deviated. So it's not a tension pneumothorax, okay? So uh, fine. Uh, what would you do next? So this is the only sort of SBA-ish. Uh, so 91% on two liters, that's what she's on. Um, I don't know, Tara, if you're still around. Uh, do you want to do a poll maybe? Is that, uh, can we do that? If not, it's Yeah, fine. yeah, I'm doing it now, yeah. Oh, sorry, out of the blue. Uh, it's just, just to see what people think. Um, Cause yeah, it's, it can be a bit tricky. Yeah, cool, so you got a poll. I won't give you too long. I'll give you like 20 seconds um, and then we can go through. Cool, right, uh, right, in the interest of time, people think, 40% uh, have gone for A, needle decompression, 20% have gone for B, 25% uh, have gone for C, and then 15% have gone for E. Um, okay, cool, so, um, fine, so she is, I, I don't, interesting actually, people have gone for these, so this is what I would, what I would do, calling my reg to put in the chest ray. 
Um, and, and the reason for that is because, let's go to the stuff why it's incorrect. So she doesn't have attention in for x yeah? Because there's no tracheal deviation, stats are okay, 91%. She has COPD, so probably she's normally 88 to 92 anyways. Um, obviously, we would have more information. I wouldn't go straight ahead and do a needle decompression in the second intercostal space, because actually it's not a tension pneumothorax. It is a pneumothorax that's not tensioning. Um, conservative management is not a good idea because the lung is completely collapsed. Bad move. I wouldn't do that. I would actually do something. I would not leave cardiothoracics to open the chest because it's a bit OTT. Uh, and then I don't think at this point she requires high flow oxygen via non rebreathed mask. And actually, to be fair, in lots of situations, when you see emergency situations, they just whack it on and, and then deal with it later and then they wean down. But in this particular scenario, I think she's fine. 91% uh, two liters probably could do a bit more, maybe. But actually, uh, the next best thing you should do is to put in a chest drain. Um, and let's just go through the uh, BTS guidelines so we know uh, everyone's on the same page. So you have a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, you have age or the over 50, significant smoking history, um, you cut, uh, or evidence of lung disease, you would consider yes, secondary pneumothorax, or no, primary pneumothorax. In this particular scenario, she is yes, secondary pneumothorax, because she has COPD, also lung cancer, but COPD, um, and is a smoker. So if they're breathless or more than two centimeters, um, then you may, you, uh, or, and they say yes, which she is, you would then chest strain. Yeah, that's what you do. Um, if no, then you may consider aspiration, and then other stuff, um, high flow oxygen, less suspected oxygen sensitive, which we are to a certain extent suspecting she might be oxygen sensitive. So we're sort of going on a more conservative approach. Um, if no, the main difference between primary and secondary is that if uh, someone has size more than two and breathless, you may try and aspirate first. Whereas in uh, primary, you probably go straight to chest drain. And if there is success, you're good. If not, then you try, sorry, you try and do a chest drain afterwards. So this is why we ran through all that. And that's why I put in chest drain. And that's why you know she is not hemodynamically unstable just yet. Um, so uh, if she was, you may consider, if, if you have someone with a primary pneumothorax and they're hemodynamically unstable, you may consider putting a chest strain as well. But in any case, you're not going to do it. Probably your reg or a very good SHO might do it. Um, and that's what you would do. And we're following the national guidelines, which are found on the BTS, British Thoracic Society guidelines. This is a very old picture putting a chest drain in. So you try and put it, you were not expected to do it. More senior people will do it, but you basically put it in under the axilla. There's like this triangle of safety where people sort of tell you it's behind the pectoralis, latimus dorsi and fifth intercostal space. And then you whack it in, it drains out. And there's, uh, yeah, this is beyond usually the undergraduate curriculum, but just to show you what it looks like if it was done in 1975. Cool. Um, cool. The lung reinflates. Very good. So the chest strain comes out. Patient goes home. You have absolutely smashed it. Uh, you've done very well. Well done to you. Um, and then as this is an integrated case, there's more stuff that happens, uh, if I recall correctly. Um, yes, the biopsy comes up and it shows that you've got, a patient, you've got adenocarcinoma. Okay, and she undergoes a left upper lobectomy. So the question I'm asked to is, what do you need to tell the patient before she undergoes surgery? What's well, the key thing, given her recent TIA? So put it in the chat. Um, if someone knows. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, good, good, good. So some people are saying stop taking antiplatelets. Very good. Yeah, so she's on antiplatelets. We started her on stuff. And we would want to try and stop that because it's increased the risk of bleeding and complications. So um, with that in mind, I will talk to you a bit about the surgical considerations um, when you are thinking about blood thinners, because that's important. And when you are an F1, oh my God, you will be the one who has to deal with it. And you're going to be the one who is doing the drug chart and you're going to have to stop lots of the medications. So good luck. So I'll tell you a bit more about it. So perioperative management of blood thinners, for those of you who are interested in surgery. Um, so clopidogrel, which you may be on, you usually stop five to seven days before. Um, and that sort of standard, so in the pre-op assessment, usually you'll tell patients, yeah, stop the clopidogrel. Um, if you're on a DOAC, direct oral anticoagulant drug, so these are the newer uh, um, anticoagulants, um, such as apixaban or rivaroxaban, you usually stop two to three days before, and that should be fine. Warfarin is a bit more of a tricky one. And the reason for that is because warfarin is a bit more long acting. You can guide it by the INR. And basically what you end up doing with warfarin is that you stop it and then you wait for the eye. Yeah, and then, so when you stop it and then you switch 
to treat the dose delta parin until the INR goes down. And then the night before surgery, you stop it completely. And then the evening of your surgery, you restart it. So if someone has a hip fracture, for example, they're on warfarin, it, it's difficult to do that because this is a more elective surgery. So obviously it's all well and good if this is elective and you have a planned lobectomy, for example, in this scenario. But sometimes in the emergency setting, you don't have this benefit. So what you would do in that case is you may give someone stuff like vitamin K to reduce the INR, and that will help you to sort of give you time to get the INR down to an acceptable level and then you can operate. But in most cases, whatever does happen, you usually would start um, low molecular heparin in the evening of the surgery, or if it's very, very major, you may start the day after. Um, so that's roughly how you operate with warfarin. Aspirin, you stop seven days before, and that's uh, standard. In certain procedures, like lumbar punctures, you can keep going with the aspirin. Clopidogrel is the one that needs to stop. Clopidogrel tends to be the one that causes more bleeding, in theory. Um, and the key, key thing I would say for you uh, as, a, as a piece of advice is that you always need to know why patients are on their medications. And the reason for that is because sometimes it's really, really not safe to stop them. The first example is if you have a mitral valve replacement on warfarin, you know, if someone's got, uh, and those ones, they have to have an INR of three to four. So it's really, really risky for them to, uh, and they may clot very easily. So therefore you need to check with the cardiologist, you know, is it okay? Should I do that? Is it fine? Uh, the other thing is that if you have drug eluting stent um, that has been recently put in for a myocardial infarction, for example, those stents, if you stop the antiplatelets, then those are more likely to thrombose. And that's bad because you can have another heart attack if your coronary artery is not working very well. So the important thing is that you have to know your patient well. If you're taking history. Uh, you may see the medical doctors do it when they are on the acute medical take. They will then sort of ask the patient why you're on this, why you're on that, and that's why. Because later on, if you've got to do stuff, you know why, and then you can assess appropriately. Cool. So that's it. Um, okay. So she has her lobectomy, yeah, which is fine, and then that was goes uh, smoothly. Um, and then we are. I, I want you to write down again, 20 seconds or so. Uh, what is your what are your differentials for the scar? So when I say differentials, for those who are thinking about it, uh, I mean sort of what, if, if you had a patient who had, um, who, who you are in an exam scenario and you asked to do a respite exam and you see the scar and you don't know anything, what are the causes of the scar? You know, what, what could be, what could have been the underlying diagnosis to lead to the scar rather than the actual name of the scar, which actually I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, so write down, I'll give you another, 10 seconds or so. Okay, someone said lung cancer, good, yep, fair. Okay, other stuff. So, so this is the sort of thing that you know, Oski, you would say, you know, someone would say to you, uh, okay, uh, you've examined this patient, you've seen this scar, what are your differentials? And, and that's something that you have to do, I think at a medical school level and finals level, definitely. Um, and then of course, in your postgraduate setting as well. Okay, so I think I've given you enough time. People have sort of thought about it. Very good. And then, um, so these are my differentials. So when you're doing a respiratory exam, the key one, so there are different types of surgery. So you can either get like a, so a lobectomy, which you try to take out the lobe uh, on its own. You can get a pneumonectomy where we take out the whole lung. Um, perhaps the scar sometimes can be a bit larger, uh, and also you can have lung transplants. Those are the sort of the main ones that you're, uh, you're thinking about. Um, you can also get volume reduction surgery for a COPD, um, and that's a sort of for people who have bully, so the, a bulla and a COPD, so like an airspace, and you can take those out, and sometimes that can improve people with COPD. So if it is a lobectomy, um, as some of you have rightly mentioned, uh, cancer is the most common one. Tuberculosis is another that is less commonly used nowadays. It used to be one of the big reasons you would have thoracic surgery um, before we had good antimicrobials, so less commonly nowadays. Bronchiectasis, you can take certain bits out if you have, inf because infections, which you get a lot in, uh, bronchiectasis, also if you have sort of bleeding into the lung as well sometimes, and also if you have a lung abscess, surgical options are, are appropriate. Uh, pneumonectomy, um, so the name of the scar, um, which, I, which is sort of a it's called a thoracotomy scar. That's one of the names that we use. I'm not sure if there's a more specific name. Um, there might be, but uh, it's sort of, it can be big, it can be small. If it's big, you may expect it to be more likely possibly to be 
maybe a pneumonectomy potentially. If it's a smaller one, um, it's a very, very small one, it could just be a biopsy, but if it's a very, very, if it's a sort of medium sized one, it could be a lot of activity. So it does sort of, you have to sort of consider it within the clinical picture. Um, and then finally, the, the other thing I would mention is that sometimes lobectomies can be done by uh, uh, this thing called uh, video-assisted thoroscopic surgery, which is uh, EVATS, and that can have sort of two or three small incisions, um, which can be uh, around the lung, um, and that can also be done, that can be a way of doing a lobectomy. Does anyone know what uh, we use VATS for as well? You may have come across it um, in, in another context. Again, it's a lung pathology. Uh, so, any ideas on the chat? Um, mm, so, yeah, so actually the VATS can be used um, for like people who have recurrent pneumothoraces. So if you have a recurrent pneumothorax, you can do like this talc pleurodesis and try and stick stuff together. And you can do that via VATS, just out of interest. It's something that we do as well, just when you're thinking about things. But certainly the most common is going to be cancer. That's the key take home point. But also you need to consider whether or not it's a lobectomy, a pneumonectomy, lung transplant. Those are the main things I would think about. But don't freak out if there's like three different uh, certain small incisions that could be the same idea as a lobectomy but could be done in a different way similar to like a laparotomy and a laparoscopy in the abdomen and then yeah so if you wanted to present your findings this is how I would do it so you would say patient has a right-sided lateral thoracotomy scar you'd say whether or not there's chest symmetry if there's any flattening so if they you know if they don't have a lung on that side like a pneumonectomy there could be reduced air entry or reduced symmetry if the trachea is deviated so if they have a pneumonectomy and the whole lung is out you could be deviated towards that side for example um, and then chest expansion is reduced Percussion notes can be dull uh, depending on what they, um, these are just sort of examples of stuff that you would think about. Um, and then you would have, for example, breath sounds vesicular, but decrease on the right upper hemothorax, as an example, vocal residence, and then if there's any wheeze or stuff. And if there is wheeze, you know, if there's someone who has wheeze, who has a bit of lung uh, wheeze, and then they have a scar, you could think, oh, could this be COPD, and they have lung reduction surgery, um, or they could have COPD, and actually they had um, a tumor over that, as we saw in that lady. So you need to sort of keep your mind open and not pin yourself down to one diagnosis and have a nice way of thinking about your differentials. That's what I would think about. So keep your, op keep your mind broad when you're asked your differential diagnosis, certainly. Cool. Well, that's this. That's it for today. So uh, a shorter session because I didn't want to uh, spend too much time on the.